Christ on this Resurrection Sunday. He is alive. Indeed. Amen. Amen. Say it out loud with me. He is alive. He is alive. Amen. So now you know how important that is. And pastor asked me about preaching today. You know, you don't ever turn down an opportunity on Easter Sunday to preach, right? I mean, it is the pivotal time of the year. I look forward to it all the time. And over the years, um, God has been good to me in, in this particular service. Um, I remember 43 years ago. I don't know if somebody may not be around then, but I remember an Easter service, 1976, Monroe Baptist Church, where I was saved. Evangelist Fred Brown was preaching. We also had the wife of a very, very famous uh, preacher who started the uh, Evansville Rescue Mission, Papa uh, Revere. Gone home with the Lord many years before, but his wife was there, and she gave a testimony about them, and that was just... You know, as a young man, as a teenager, it really impressed me. But what they preached that day. Then the other thing the pastor did, he had traveled, uh, Pastor Glenn had traveled over to Israel and, and led some tours in Israel. When they at the garden tomb, he took pictures. And uh, back in the day, that's before, you know, we had our own, uh, you know, our cell phones to take pictures. So he had reproduced that picture and then gave everybody in the service a a folder within it showing the garden tomb of where Christ could have been laid that after his crucifixion. I remember keeping that in my Bible for years. It just, wow, it was like, that's amazing. You know? uh, I don't know how you approach when you come to the house of God to hear from God and what, what the word of God does for you today, but it's my prayer that that is exactly what God will do today. And you will see Jesus. You remember, when we started this year in 2023, and that first Sunday, I asked you, will we see Jesus in this year of 2023? Will we see him? Well, maybe you'll see him today in a way you hadn't before. I don't know. Praise God. Pray God that he will give you that blessing this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dig in. Heavenly Father, we love you this morning. Thank you for this Resurrection Sunday, which every Sunday is really, but as we on the calendar celebrate it, the world has a different view of it, obviously, than we do, but... We have the right view. We have your view. That's why. That's what we want to see today. We want to look at Jesus in a way maybe we hadn't before. And I pray, Lord, that even now you be with the Sunday school teachers and those kids in the class that they would really understand the importance. Yes, it's exciting to get treats and things during this time of the year. But we are reminded, Lord, that that uh, without a Savior that willingly died for our sins and was buried and then rose again, we wouldn't have a reason to celebrate today. We wouldn't even have a reason to be here. Uh, we would have no hope for eternal life. And yet, Lord, it's all just the opposite of that. We have all of that because of what Jesus did. And as the verse we're going to learn for this week reminds us, he showed his love. He demonstrated his love. And that while we were yet sinners, didn't wait till we got our act better together, or wait until we were good uh, for 10 days in a row so that we could prove that we deserve to be in heaven. None of that works. There's no such thing as working your way into heaven. And so I'm thankful, Lord, today that you saved me. I'm thankful, Lord, that you would show us today, be with the folks uh, that are here, our regular Grace Church, and then our visitors and families today. We're glad for them. So we pray your blessing on all things that said today. In Jesus' wonderful name, we praise you. Amen. amen. And amen. A special greeting to our visitors that are here today. And um, a visit... Uh, New family here, Paul and Pauline. Good to see you this morning. Glad to have you. Hope you come back. And a longtime friend of mine, Pauline, and her family is here. So give them a shout when you can. Uh, we're glad to have them uh, on board today. And then uh, looking around the room, most of you look pretty pretty familiar. I got <clears throat> Brother Frank in the back row to guard the door so none of you can run away during our preaching. He said he would, he would stick his cane out if you tried to run. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> Oh, uh, he's going to get me for that one later. I know that. <clears throat> Any case. At the arrest of Jesus, there was something said in John chapter 18. Don't turn now. I just want to give you a bit of it because it's going to set the stage a little bit where I'm going today. And uh, over the years of having the chance to preach all of the angles <laughs> of resurrection, I couldn't do them all for you today, but I'm going to hit one today I haven't done before, but I've always wanted to, so... I'll give you a shot at it today. But in John 8, 14, Jesus, therefore, knowing all things. Listen to that. Jesus, knowing all things, because he's God. He's all-knowing. 
that should come unto him went forth. He went right forth, and right at the point where they were coming to arrest him, instead of turning and running, he stepped forward. Who are you looking for? I'm here. That's the kind of servant, uh, uh, servant uh, savior we have. So Easter really is the most radiant day in the world, but the days before and after Easter do not lack in loveliness, if you think about it. Easter is a day of triumph, but the days that lead up to the triumph are fragrant with deep meaning and deeper sentiment. For example, the days before Easter hold Christ's thrilling entry into Jerusalem when the hooves of that patient steed walked over a carpet of palms and I must admit, my first time in Africa was 1988 in the Congo, in DRC, uh, then known as Zaire. We were traveling in the interior from Kinshasa in the capital. We were going up to the Kasai Occidental region. It took us two days by a uh, four-wheel drive truck to get through. And as we go along, you'd see these different roads that pass the, 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 they're not highways like here, okay? They're sandy roads, mostly. And uh, I started noticing that there were big palm trees standing up like by the fences of these roads and then some on the ground and I said to Mr. Dan I said what's that about Dan he said oh no what happens is, is that if a, an official is coming into the area it could be a, a government official could be somebody of importance whatever if they know they're coming they will lay these palm leaves out uh, in, in respect to show them that we're glad you've come and I wonder where they got that idea right here and when Jesus walked into Jerusalem. So they hold the, uh, when you think about the fact that they hold the Last Supper when Christ, knowing that his life on earth was nearing the end, he broke bread with the ones he loved best. And this is the Holy Thursday when Christ prayed so intently, drops of blood in a garden that was kissed by a traitor and betrayed by a friend. Then there's Good Friday that crowned the supreme sacrifice with thorns. There is the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter and a period of grief and patience and prayer. And then there are the lily flowers in bloom and the birds singing and, and the moment of the resurrection. You know, the days before Easter, beloved, teach us that applause must be accepted humbly, that it can swiftly fade into the twilight of forgetfulness. I mean, they teach us that we should be meek in our moments of triumph and that we should rely not upon the fickle social crowd, but upon the unspoken praise of the greatest judge. And before and after Easter, they teach us tolerance. Never the tolerance of a pilot who washed his hands and let it go of that, but the sort of Christian tolerance that offers sympathy and help and refuses to take part in any wrongdoing. They, these are troubled times we're living in, wouldn't you agree? And not to burst your bubble, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. But God is in control, amen? Just remember that. But these are troubled times in which we're living for sure and they teach us that God's will is not always our will, but that we must accept it. So they teach us that Life and love can survive even scorn and crucifixion. And sometimes we know that there are barriers ahead and that pain will be a part of that future. Christ knew all too well that torture was his heritage, that during the Holy Week he was rapidly approaching a moment of extreme grief, extreme grief. And yet this knowledge did not make him a spectator at the, at the feast. He kept his appetite and his philosophy and his good cheer and his trust in the Father. He could, you see, Jesus went forth. All this back to that verse in John 18, 4. Jesus went forth because only he could save us. What love. Amen? What love. And so, just as a way of introduction, I think it's good for us to understand a little bit more about this man we call Jesus. Open your Bibles with me to Matthew 16. You say, wait a minute, that's a little bit farther in than the resurrection. Yeah, it is. And while you're turning to Matthew 16, <clears throat> I'm going to give you the one question, the one question that Google cannot answer. <laughs> Matthew 16, 
You ever heard that before? Yeah. Okay. Here it is. <clears throat> Who is Jesus to you? Ask yourself that question. Who is Jesus to you? Now that's not original with me. That's Jesus asking that question. Look at me with, with me in this passage, verse 13. I mean, we find the revelation of the person of the king here. You can find this in Mark chapter 8 and Luke chapter 9 as well. But here's what, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? It's most like a trick question. He gave you the answer when he said that, didn't he? <laughs> Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Right? So they said, well, some say John the Baptist. That's not a bad guy to be compared to, huh? Who is John the Baptist? Do you remember what Jesus said about that man? He said, of, of all the people in the world, born of woman, there was none greater. That's what Jesus said. Oh, and then the, he finished his statement by saying, and the least in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than John. That's you and I. Isn't that amazing? So you don't have to be John the Baptist. He's already got his end. We can be in there by the grace of God through Jesus, right? Through the cross, through the through that empty grave, that first Easter. Yeah. So they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. Son of Elijah. Now what do we know about Elijah? What did he look like? Do you ever wonder when Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? And when the glory of the Lord started coming out of Jesus, which is as God that would do that, and then all of a sudden they, no they noticed they were kind of sleepy, but they were waking up now when they saw that glory coming out. And they looked and they said, wait a minute, there's two other guys standing there talking to him. And the one is Moses and the one is Elijah. And I first thought, how do they know that? They didn't have any pictures in an encyclopedia to look at, did they? <laughs> I don't think we had that stuff back in those days. Unless Jesus used their name, or less, you know, I don't know. But that's, that's, that's one of the questions you want to ask those guys when you get to heaven, okay? And whoever gets it first, you get the chocolate. There's a big chocolate, all right? And you must share it with us when we get there. Right. They said, no, it's Elijah. And others said, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. I mean, they're just kind of covering their tracks here, don't you think? <laughs> like it. Like, Jesus asked him a very important question, so we better give him every answer he's looking for, right? Do you ever do that sometimes? You know, we're kind of guilty of that, aren't we? And he said to them, here it is, verse 15, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If there's ever a time in Peter's life that he got the answer right, this was it. <laughs> For all the things we know about Peter, man, fishermen and all this stuff about him, man, he nailed it right here. But it was he wasn't on his own. Even Jesus admits that. Jesus answered said, And blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, right after that, we have the revelation of the church. Verse 18 there is when he talks about he's building his church on Christ, but Peter's going to be a part of that, of that ministry. Fantastic when you say so. To honor the death and resurrection of Jesus, we must believe that Jesus is God. If we miss this point, Easter means nothing. And without this belief, Easter, Easter is just another holiday on the calendar that features some Easter bunnies, some, some colored eggs and religious traditions. I must admit, as a child, and there was one many years ago. My older brother and I enjoyed Easter because my mom, they weren't saved. They got into Easter, man. She did the big baskets and the chocolate. You know, uh, I had this thing when I get this chocolate bunny and I would eat it by starting at the top of the ear. <laughs> and then uh, through the day and through the week, I would eat it all the way to the bottom, you know, finish it. You know. I always wondered why we always had to go to the dentist. I couldn't figure out why. But we had all this candy. My mom was... Not generous and giving us lots of candy. And then when I got old enough to get saved and talk about what Easter is about, you know, she, she, you know, she still liked to give the candy, but she at least got that real story with it. 
that time too. But So Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Well, the, the men quickly answered by listing some of the prevalent views of the day. Their three answers indicate to the average person, Jesus was a good person, but not the best. Right? And uh, he was a prophet, but not the prophet of God. And he was the true identity. His true identity came from Simon Peter in verse 16. Social media didn't have the answer. Just like Google can't help you with this question either. Social media couldn't do it. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he's right. This correct statement then led to the revelation of the church. But this true identity of Jesus was an issue in his lifetime. And it is still an issue in the current thinking of public opinion today. What were the popular opinions regarding Jesus? Were, were they seeing Jesus clearly? Were they seeing Jesus at all? <laughs> you know, not just clearly. Some people taught that Jesus was John the Baptist who had risen from the dead. And I always find it interesting that some people Worldly people, unsaved people, sometimes, and it's kind of an embarrassment to us as, as a Christian if when we do not represent the Lord properly and an unsaved person said, says something like this, well, I thought you were a Christian. It's like, ooh, that one stings. You know? uh, so sometimes when we don't say something to stand for the Lord, people notice that just as much as if we say something, you know, you know, dramatic, biblical, and that kind of thing. So, you know, that's why James, is very, that verse in James 4, is, you know, is hard. For him to know what they do good and do what they not, the end of sin. So we we got to be careful that we're, we're following God in the right, right order of things. But, um, so, so that said, I'm thinking back to what would we have done different if we'd have been there the day that Jesus died? Now, I, <clears throat> I've been teaching a lesson to the kids in Quanagazi, and we'll finish it today. Um, about when Lazarus died, the friend of Jesus, Mary and Mother, you know, brother and sister, they were close friends of Jesus and all that story and, and everything. But when, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, he told him, well, you know, we got to help him unwrap those, those grave cloths you put around, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then it wasn't even two weeks later, chronologically, that Jesus now was arrested and falsely accused and beaten and put on a cruel cross and then died. And then now he's in a borrowed tomb. Joseph of Marathia borrowed, let him use his tomb. And now he's been in the grave. And, and it's like all this promise, we had been promised the kingdom was coming. We're going to defeat the Romans. We're going to have our own Jewish king. It's fantastic. And now he's gone. Death sometimes puts people in a depressive mood. Depression can be, can be overwhelming. It can cause you to to raft and not do things that you shouldn't do. And, and, and yet, I mean, some of the examples, for example, the women who were sent, uh, who stood by the cross and arrived at the garden with spices and ointments to, to complete the burial. They, they wondered as they walked there, this is Matthew, uh, Mark 16, it says, who shall roll away the stone? Well, wow, that's a big deal because that was a big, heavy stone. And not that these ladies weren't strong enough to do it, but it was just, designed not to be moved by the average person, you know. And uh, then they discovered when they got there, the stone was already gone. By the way, just in case you're wondering, they didn't move the stone, the angels, the earthquake, God's power didn't move that stone so Jesus could get out. He was already out. That stone was removed so we could look in and see that he wasn't there. There's a big difference, right? Just so you can get the right perspective there, right? Uh, and then we have what well, Pastor read this morning. I, 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 this is amazing. You've got angels here knowing what's going on. <laughs> and they, they're there and they, they say, he's not here for he's risen, as he said. And sometimes we read what Jesus says and we know well, that sounds good, but we don't believe it like we should. Right? We might say yes to it some, but not all the way. And that's why we can get caught up in things. Now, here's something that you might have not thought of. The Roman guards report the resurrection to the chief priest. That's in Matthew 28, verses 11 to 15. 
I won't take time to look at that, but let me tell you about this stolen body theory that they, they you know, also <clears throat> found in the early Jewish writings. It was refuted this way. The laws of legal evidence, the guards said that disciples stole the body while they were sleeping. I won't think too hard about that. But let me just say, if they were sleeping, how did they know what happened? Yeah. Okay. The absurdity of the story that the Romans would sleep while on guard duty, it was the death penalty by being burned alive to do so. So you think if you were a soldier, you were going to sleep when it was your job to sleep? No, I don't think so. Uh, the absurdity of admitting the story, if it was true, why not lie and live? I mean, why would they admit something that's going to cause them death? I don't think so. And, and the absurdity of the idea that the soldiers could sleep through moving a several ton stone. And let me tell you why, because the Roman law required that guards to, to rotate sleeping shifts, and those sleeping had to sleep with their head resting on the guarded object. In this case, the stone in front of the tomb. So you see how this really kind of falls apart. I mean, we have other pictures of Peter in prison between and Paul with chained between soldiers. Why? Because their job was to guard that, that prisoner. That's why they were that. That close. Same idea here. The fact that the soldiers were not punished. You ever wondered about that? Yeah. So this theory's got to be blown up. The fact that the, the disciples themselves did not believe the resurrection stories, which is sad, but, you know, let's be honest, we might, we, we, we might have a problem with that too. The fact that the disciples gained nothing but suffering through their claims. And the fact that the disciples never recanted even under torture. So this theory is actually a strong evidence, right, for the fact that both the first century Jews and the Romans admitted that the tomb was indeed empty. All other skeptical naturalist explain, explanations have been thoroughly discredited even by the skeptics himself as, as, as history is reported. There, there's also many individuals who sought to disprove the resurrection and were event, eventually converted to Christ because once they saw the evidence, they couldn't, they couldn't deny the truth. For example, Simon Greenfield, Lee, the royal professor of the law of Harvard University, probably the greatest authority on legal evidence who ever lived, came to know Christ when he tried to disprove the resurrection. Frank Morrison, British lawyer and author of Who Moved the Stone? The book, also. Lou Wallace, author of Ben Hur, the book Ben Hur became a major motion picture. Yeah. And Josh McDowell, author of Evidence to Demands a Verdict and the Resurrection Factor. All these people proving, trying to prove the resurrection wasn't true, became saved because of it. And then we, we think about from the road to Jerusalem to the Emmaus road. That's an amazing one. Jesus joins two of the followers, Cleopas and another person on the road to Emmaus, but they didn't recognize him. And he asked them what they were discussing. And then did you know, Jesus said, why are you sad? Why were they depressed? Why were they, what was going on here? I'll tell you, they just weren't, they just weren't remembering that when Jesus said he was coming, he was coming back and they weren't listening. They weren't aware of it. And then the following Sunday, Jesus walks through a locked door and appears to the disciples, including Thomas. We always give doubting Thomas a hard time because he said the week before he wasn't there when Jesus first came. And he said, well, until I put my hands in the nail prints of his hands and put my fist in that side of that big spear made that hole inside, I'm not going to believe. You know what they were saying? Seeing is believing. It's kind of like that rich man and Lazarus story there in Luke 16, I believe it is. Where the guy finally, you know, said, you know, can you send somebody to warn my brothers? Maybe they didn't get along when he was alive. But now that he's now in hell and suffering, he's become an evangelist. Doesn't want him to come there. And then he said, you know, and then he even suggests to, 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 to Abraham, to, to the Lord, should, even if somebody from back from the dead would come back and warn him. And Jesus said to him, even if that happened, they still will not believe because it did happen. It did happen. Jesus did come back today. So did Lazarus. So did some of the other people Jesus raised. And some people were affected by it. Many more were not. So that story doesn't fly too much. But I'll never forget in John 20, 29, what Jesus said to Thomas when he finally realized, my Lord and my God, right? This is one of the greatest statements of Christ's deity in Scripture right here. 
in John 20, 28. But in verse 29, Jesus said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That would be us. Praise God. Eh? Praise the Lord. Paul said something very interesting in 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9. He said, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed, perplexed and not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. And George Matheson, the great Scottish preacher who, when he was told by a famous eight, uh, occultist, that he was going blind, he wrote these lovely words. Here's what he said. Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul on thee. Also, O oh, joy that seeketh me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain. Listen to these lines from his pen. There are times uh, when things look very dark to me, so dark that I have to want, wait even for hope. Wait for hope. These people were not hoping in God, and they, he, he was right there with them for those three and a half years before the cross, before the death, before the burial. And now the resurrected Savior is out. A long defeated, deferred fulfillment carries its own pain, but to wait for hope, to see no glimmer of a prospect, and yet to refuse to despair. You see, it takes, a real, it takes real faith to trace the rainbow through the rain. But it takes the storm cloud to make the rainbow. Why not? Why art thou cast down, the psalmist said? That, uh, hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him. And that, it seems like we miss some of these critical thinking things when we're letting difficulties in life bypass the fact that God can use his, his opportunity. Psalm 37, 39 says, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in time of trouble. So, who is Jesus to you? today? Is he your Savior? Is he your Lord? Is he someone that you would run to in the, the blink of an eye? You see, D.L. Moody said that God's ways of answering his people's prayers is not by removing the pressure but by increasing their strength to bear it. Ah. Charles Spurgeon said, we are sinking by our struggles when we might float by faith. Yeah, you ought to be there. Our God is God for difficulties. Difficulties are God's opportunities. Yeah, I think we need to kind of let it have its rightful place for this understanding to, 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 to take, take root. So they said it was John the Baptist. This view was held by the general public, but it was also the opinion of Herod who had John the Baptist killed in, in uh, Matthew 14, verse 2. So a key opinion of the religious crowd was that Jesus was Elijah the prophet. This view was, was re related to, the, to Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. In that prophet he said it said it is still observed at many current passover observances today jewish families uh, often include an empty chair at the dinner table why in case elijah was to come back well he came back to jesus transform it uh, you know his, his tra uh what's that word i'm trying to say that one he, when he did that he came for that Another opinion led that Jesus was Jeremiah the prophet. I, I thought this was kind of funny, actually. A legend was found in the Second Maccabees 2.18. I wouldn't recommend that you believe all that stuff, but people do. Held that Jeremiah held, hid the ark of the altar of incense in a cave, and he would personally restore them to prominence at a future time. So that's probably why his name was mentioned when they said, who do people say that I am? Well, it could be Jeremiah. Still others think that Jesus was just one of the prophets, part of a series of prophets God sent to Israel as forerunners to the Messiah. I don't know. I, I think that's kind of a weak argument. But you know something? Of the life of Jesus, historian Philip Schaff said, 
And this is uh, in, the, in the book, The Person of Christ, it's uh, the American Trackside, written in 1913. He said this, Jesus of Nazareth, without money and arms, conquered more millions than Alexander, Caesar, Mohammed, and Napoleon. Without science and learning, he shed more light on things human and divine than all the philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of schools, he spoke such words of life that was never spoken before or since and produced effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he set more pins to motion, furnished themes for more sermons, orators, discussions, learned volumes, works of art and songs of praise than the whole army of great men of ancient and modern times. Wouldn't you agree with me? It's a good place to say, Amen. 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 So, how do you come out of the depression if you, you've lost your Savior, he's buried and gone? What do you do next? Well, you might need to talk yourself out of depression. Is it what? Well, that's what the psalmist did. In Psalm 42, 5 says, Why are you cast down? Oh, my soul, why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. All right, now, where did he come from, that thought? Where did that thought come from? Well, it's interesting. In the book Spiritual Depression, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the insightful pastor of London Westminster Chapel from 1939 through 1968, that's a good run, wasn't it? Warned that too many Christians listen to themselves rather than talking to themselves. You ever done that? Listen to yourself? <laughs> Instead of talking to yourself? He said, the main art of spiritual living is to know how to handle yourself. You have to take yourself in hand. You have to address yourself, preach to yourself, question yourself. And that was on page 21 of that book, Spiritual Depression. We too often allow our thoughts to run astray rather than corralling and controlling them through biblical meditation, especially when we're discouraged, cast down this scripture uses to the language of Psalm 42 and 43. We need to talk ourselves out of the depression. Now, it's interesting. Maybe just take a minute to look at those two verses, uh, those two Psalms. It would be profitable, I think. Psalm 42 says, right on the beginning, and these are the, to the chief physician in contemplation of the sons of Korah. And as the deer pants for the water brook, so pant my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? And so he says, my tears have been my food day and night. While, while they continue to say to me, where is your God? Do you think that they said to the disciples that day, where is your Savior? And that might have that might have hurt. And maybe you have unsafe family or friends that say that to you too. Where is God now? I said he's coming back. He's not here yet. It's been a while. Well, I want you to first notice the structure of the pair of the Psalms, which they, <clears throat> they really should be a single unit. They, they take us through three stanzas of complaint, each a result in the three repeated refrain. Why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you, why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation of my God, which is the end of, of the next verse here, verse 5. Why are you cast down? Hope in God, for I shall praise him for the help of his countenance. All right. So he begins here by talking to him with this deer-like thirst, expresses a worshiper's love for God. Right. But the problem is, we often think of this phrase, that it's just like he's just thirsty, but it's really an agonizing, terrifying thirst of an animal wasted away in, in a time of drought, if you can imagine that. So it's, it, it's not a lot of water, so he's very, very uh, upset. And the psalmist beside himself with grief. He's, he's oppressed. He's been exiled from Jerusalem and the temple, far away from the northern border of Israel. The locations of Mount Hermon and Mizra in 42 verse 6 it's mentioned. And away from the temple, he feels exalted, uh, from God himself and he feasts only on tears day and night he is tormented by his enemies who mock him by mocking his God from afar he remembers the times of corrupt uh, corporate worship where he led, led the people of Israel in praise these guys were song leaders in the in the temple um, uh, the sons of Korah um, were temple musicians however with a glorious memory is bittersweet for it reminds him of all he's lost. And finally, he talks to himself. See, he's been thinking long and been staying depressed. 
Then he finally says to himself, what's wrong with you? Why are you giving up? Why are you depressed? Hope in God. It's just like the time Jesus and his disciples, after a long day of prayer, a long day of ministry, they get in a boat and he tells them right at the beginning. And this is the thing. You've got to listen to God at the beginning of every time you read the Bible because you're going to miss something. You don't pay attention from the start to the finish when he's speaking. He said, let's, let's go to the other side. So he gets in the boat. He's tired from ministry. He puts his head on a pillow and goes to sleep. <laughs> they got in the middle of, of the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias. It's got different names. And storms come up regularly. I believe Satan was also trying to put them out. And they got all upset when the storm comes. Kind of the waves start rolling in and they wake him. Master, don't you care? We're going to die. And then he was just like, what did I say at the beginning? Are we on shore yet or are we in the middle? We're in the middle. I said, well, I said we're going to the other side. When you have Jesus in your boat and he says you're going to the other side, is there any chance you're not going to get to the other side? No chance. How could they be so hope in God? They forget to hope in God, even when God is with them. And by the way, when the Spirit of God dwells with you, he's with you too. So you're not alone in this journey. Don't forget that. So did the darkness break? Depression really works that way? Well, the psalmist immediately climbed out of the pit for a while. <laughs> then the darkness returned. You know, so after a few, some of these ladies came back to the, to the disciples and said, yeah, we saw him. We've seen him. He's alive. No, I don't believe there's no way. So they go running Peter and John. John's more fit. He gets there first, but he has enough respect to wait that we'll end the tomb. Peter comes flying in and sliding in there. And they see that the grave clothes are just exactly where they laid him. Not that they maybe had seen how that was done. But unlike Lazarus, who now had to have the grave clothes taken off him, Jesus didn't have to. Because when he rose from the grave clothes, the grave clothes were like a cocoon in the same position where they were on his body. So the grave clothes didn't keep him in the tomb either. Yeah. There's some people who think that some cloth that they found maybe has his image on it. I don't know. I don't know. Put a lot of stock to those things. Um, if God wanted us to find Noah's Ark, we'd find it. Don't have to find it to believe it happened, do we? Because the Bible says so. And uh, anyway, <clears throat> hope in God. That's all I can say. So he says, God, if you're my rock, why does it feel like you forgot me? Why are you letting my pressures win even when I mourn? Why, where are you? You're taunting me and you're asking where are you? I'm asking where you are. I'm wondering the same thing. Where am I getting that? Verse 9 and 10. He says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I mourn because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the breaking of my bones, it's kind of like a shattering. As with uh, my enemies reproach me, they revile me. My in uh, and when they say to me all day long, where is your God? Then he finally wakes up. <laughs> Hope. He says, why are you cast out on my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help or literally the salvation of my countenance and my God. Mm -hmm. So he says again, what's wrong with you? Hope in God. Mm -hmm. Don't stay defeated. Don't let the enemy win. The world, the flesh, the devil, it can be a problem. But if you're putting on the armor of God, as we've been talking about in the Bible study, if you, and if you're walking in the spirit, not fulfilling us the flesh, if you're memorizing scripture, if you're keeping that before you, it will help you be successful. But you have to do your part. God's just not going to make you a perfect Christian. I mean, he does technically in Christ, but, but then we're still in this world. We still have the old nature. We still have a tendency to be, have our own way and still be a prideful. And all the problems that will negate things, thank God for his patience, long-suffering, eh? So, maybe like Fighting your way out of John Bunyan's slough of despond or the pit of despair isn't easy. You don't, you don't just quote a verse or say a prayer and try it, but, but don't give up. Be encouraged that the sons of Korah, like them, under divine inspiration, recorded the same ups and downs, the same inconsistency, and the same depression, and they prayed with success to the same God and Savior who wasn't even born in raised and had a ministry yet, but they, they look forward to that like we look back to the cross. Same power. How much more can you know in the finished work of Christ preach yourself through depression? 
Well, it's only by grace, by God's grace. We need to let the gospel inspire us to, to fight for joy again and again. Paul said it so well. He said, you rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Right? So we should. We should do that. Now, we've seen these different things that they said about who, who the people say is. Not to mention the disciples that they mentioned the opinion of the Pharisees that Jesus was belly of Beelzebub in Matthew 10, 25. The scribes also labeled Jesus by this title. And the scribes said he was Beelzebub and by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons in Mark 3, 22. I always thought that was kind of strange. If he really is in that position, why would he cast out his guys? He's, you know, it's more like he would keep them in play, right? It didn't make sense. Beelzebub was another name for Satan. And the opinion not only rejected Jesus as God, but it's also named him as Satan, the Lord of filth. So all of these opinions, beloved, have the same have some things in common. All granted greatness to Jesus, but none of them granted deity to him. Each view permitted the supernatural, but all the, only the last view had an answer to the question, but each answer was wrong. Jesus followed up that first question with that second question. Who do you say that I am? And how would you answer Jesus today? He's asking you. If you were standing there that day with the other disciples. The most significant word in this question is the word you. And until each person decides who Jesus is, doesn't make any difference what others think of Jesus. Peter began his answer to that second question by saying, you are the Christ. The Christ of the New Testament is the equivalent of Messiah, the anointed one. Pastor mentioned on, on our uh, uh, fellowship on Friday. The fulfillment of Old Testament messianic prophecies describe Messiah as uh, more than human. His origin is from everlasting. Prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Peter continued with the words, the son of the living God. So Jesus, hear me now, is the one true God who took on human flesh and he cannot be equated with human idols. He is Israel's Messiah and he is God the Son. Now, as a result of Peter's answer, Jesus pronounced a blessing upon Peter for acknowledging his true identity. He is the Son of God who came as Israel's Messiah, praise God. But Peter did not come to that conclusion strictly by human opinion. God the Father revealed the truth to Peter, and he believed it for himself, verse 17 tells us. <laughs> so, beloved, as we honor the death and resurrection again this year, may we do it as a matter of belief, and not just as another holiday. How much, do, how much more do we need than just Jesus' words and the witnesses of all the people that were there? We serve a living Savior. He's in the world today. How do I know? Because he's in my heart. And he can be in yours too if you haven't trusted in him. It's a as simple as admitting what the Bible tells us, all of sin comes surely to learn. Admit that you, you are that sinner and believe that Jesus died on the cross for you. Confess that sin, ask him to forgive you and come in your heart and be your savior forever and you will have your sins forgiven. You will be placed in the family of God and you will have a permanent home in heaven, guaranteed. And I've known that on, on June 19th this year will be for me... Uh, how old was I last Sunday? 65? 55 years. I was 10. <laughs> it's always easy to remember the year we were 10. And then in June this year, we'll be married 45 years. So the Lord helped, knew I needed to have even numbers to win. <laughs> so praise God. God is faithful, amen. And we need to be sued. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness today. Thank you for the faithfulness. Wow. As we think about the events of the first glorious resurrected Sunday and all of all of the things there's so much more that went on that we don't even know uh, we'll find out someday in heaven but what's recorded in scripture is powerful enough for us to just say wow what a savior and yet we don't always believe you Lord because if we have to answer that question who is Jesus to you then we have to be honest Lord are you really the, the savior that you you can be, and we give you a rightful place in every area of our life. Maybe there's something we need to confess today, Lord. We're going to go to communion again, and we need to make sure we have things right between you and ourselves. We also make sure that we 
have things right between uh, others, family or friends. If there's something odd, I pray, Lord, that we get it right now, even just before, so that we can come into that fellowship, that sweet fellowship. Lord, we love you. Thank you for giving us this day to rejoice in the Lord. And we can rejoice in you always because you're a king of kings and the Lord of lords, and you're coming again. I pray, Lord, we'll be ready to meet you when that trumpet blows that day. In Jesus' name I praise you. Amen. Amen. Amen.